as, a, as an experiment, and I don't normally do this, but um, some people have said they like hearing me talk. And if you look down in the description of this um, uh, video, you will see a mile marker, a time marker that you can go to if you don't want to hear me talk. And you may not want to hear me, so you can just move the cursor ahead to that mile marker and you're fine. This, uh, um, I just wanted to point out a few little things uh, that I find quite interesting in this piece. This piece is one of the uh, most infrequently played of the Beethoven sonatas, and I'm not sure why. Um, it's it's uh, um, it, it, it's very humorous and funny and very lighthearted, um, and uh, while well, still being Beethoven. And um, the first thing that um, we notice in this, in this pian in this sonata, piano sonata, is uh, Beethoven doesn't write the hands together. So you have and then finally together. So it, it, it's syncopated. It's syncopated the whole way. And I remember here uh, reading uh, um, Alfred Brendel had a little quip about this sonata. He said there was a woman, he played it one time, there was a woman in the front row that came up to him after the concert and said how much she liked it, but she wished he could, he could play his hands together. And so I, I don't think that's a true story, or, or she was probably joking. What would she be doing in the front row if she wasn't, if she didn't know what was going on? At any rate, um, you, you, have, you have that syncopation throughout. Um, Sonata, you might have the second, the second theme, you might have in the dominant key. And in this case, the dominant key would, key would be D major, but Beethoven gives us a second theme in B major, which is quite, which is quite fun. So, outside his apartment and and there and there'd be a busker on the street with a monkey and a and a pan playing a, you you know it, it it's so lighthearted you know that's a serious about it at all so that's the second thing the uh, um, uh. transition, this is not unusual, but you have a long transition from the development to the recap. And uh, normally that's over a, um, uh, a dominant pedal point, this is no exception. So yeah. <laughs> Finally, ending up, um, uh, it, just your standard recap, and finally ending up, and it's time for the coda. And so we get into the coda, and the coda is all about the hands not playing together. And here's it. So you have, 
fluctuate, um, you know, pace out the recap. And what's interesting, or one thing that's interesting, is that you, you see this, this syncopation echoed in the coda for the last movement, which, you know, is coming up. And it, it's, it's quite a brilliant coda, but it ends, it ends like this, so uh, let's say... Which I think echoes the, the end of the verse movement. That's, that's the only nod to the first movement, I think, in the last movement. The second movement is um, operatic in nature. Now, there, there is um, there's a debate in the, piano, in the piano community, and some people believe that this movement is an opera parody, and, and I'm in that group, and then there's another group that believes this is um, serious. Just like Buster Keaton can be serious. humorous side. So uh, what's going on here is this is, a, is this is an opera parody. And so we have, we have a soprano and we have a baritone. And there's the, they're the stars of the show. But who would you imagine would be the big star? Well, that would be the soprano, right? Because the soprano's up there in the, in the high range with the high notes and the, and the baritones just keep going. So when, when we open up, we have the exposition. And the, and the soprano. Cadenza. And the point is, is that a lot of things in opera are ridiculous, but we love them anyway, right? And so then the, the baritone comes in, and, um, and everything is interspersed, interspersed with these outrageous um, filigree cadenzas. And yeah. <laughs> So, and, um, and then finally they, the soprano comes, the, the baritone comes in, doesn't really have much of a part, and the soprano comes in to, to restate her part, because she's so important. And then, rooms were open at night. I had to find, often find something to do. I wasn't ready to go back to my miserable little bungalow and go to bed. Uh, I didn't have a TV, but there was nothing on TV anyway. Good times, I guess. Um, and, and go to bed. And so I'd want to do something. So I had a choice. I could go to a, a um, Hollywood movie, or I could go to the, to the Met um, and for, sta in, for standing room. 
and the standing room was less expensive than going to a theater and watching a movie. So I would do that frequently. And when we had the... How many times have I been in an Italian opera of this period, usually a comedy, that haven't had a section, you know, so we have an exposition that introduces you to the main characters, and in this case, a, a soprano and a baritone, and then we, it's a minor key, we come down to something more serious. And what, what's going on here? It, it just is unmistakable to me. Nobody's saying, or orchestrated, something's going on in the pit. So they've got a little interlude, and what's going on on stage, and you would often see this, is that they're moving the stage, they're, re, they're changing the set. It, you know, it's not a huge change, but it's enough, and they might bring out some plants, and then you're all of a sudden you're outdoors, and and so this is for about eight bars, one, two, three, four, six bars, no, two, four, six, six bars, and then um, and then you're all set up, and uh, now you're all set. Now where else does Beethoven write something as banal as this. But you hear, this is what you hear in the opera. And so, you know, they're, they're sitting down, the, the string players, they can't see anything. They don't really know what's going on unless they've read the libretto and, they, you know, they're just wanting their paycheck. And then your soprano. Now, what I think is going on and, and again, I'm using my imagination here. I, you know, this is not musicology. I don't know that this is what Beethoven meant, but this is what it means to me. What I'm hearing is they've changed the set, and it, in Italian opera, some, and particularly in the comedies, you'll see they'll change the set, the lights will go down, and then the two principals will come out on opposite ends of the stage, and they don't know the other one is there, so they can talk about the other one. And I think that's what's happening here. And so. First, it's it's um, it's the soprano, and then, then we have the baritone, the plot second. But still, they don't know each. You no, know, the other one is there. I mean, I'm making up a story. That's not musicology. That's a story. Or but it fits, in, in my mind it fits. And then you, and then you have, um, uh, and then that part is done, and then you have another. And again, you can imagine that, you can imagine the pit crew doing. And so what we're doing is establishing the pedal point on the dominant G. And this goes on for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven bar. Well, actually, uh, eight bars. So, depending on where you want to count. Uh, and then we get... And then we come back to... So that's a recap. We heard this at the beginning. And that's the soprano. She came back. And she has a little bit different... That's, that's the accompaniment. Now, this is not the tidiest or more most interesting uh, accompaniment Beethoven could have done. But in this, as a parody of what's going on, it's perfectly appropriate, I think. So, so they, the um, soprano comes out, and then the baritone.
Tell me that's not over the top. That's completely over the top. And there it is. Soprano again. And this is this is uh, pretty much what we had before with a different accompaniment. But there's an added twist in here, which is the pianist's twist. And uh, when I was playing this, uh, people would come up to me and ask me about this this measure I'm going to talk about right now. How do you do that? And it's the same material, but he has uh, embellished it so that the right hand is doing 11 per beat, and the left or the right hand is doing 11 per beat, and the the right the left hand the right hand is doing 11. And the left hand is doing six. So it's six against 11. And I've talked to other pianists, and how do you do that? And, and they, you know, they have stories about how some pianists are successful, and some pianists just kind of, you know, aren't very successful. And the one who apparently is the worst <laughs> was Glenn Gould. And what he did, and so, you know, if you had 12 notes in the right hand and six notes in the left hand, it would fit together perfectly. And so what Glenn Gould does is he sits on the first note for, for two counts, and then, um, and then that. So yesterday, I finished my little talk, and, um, and last night I went and uh, with the intention of stitching the little talk as a, as a prelude to the actual performance. And, um, and then, I, then I discovered that the camera had cut off in the middle of my talk. And I didn't have very much left, but I had just been talking about, um, uh, if you recall, the, the um, rhythmic uh, challenge uh, where Beethoven writes 11 against 6. So 11 notes against 6 notes in the bass. And it, it's really hard to find a, a musical reason for it. Um, if we had him, sitting, had him sitting right here, I'm sure he could explain it in German. Um, but we don't, uh, and I'm just <laughs> interested that it, that it seems to be uh, just a, a challenge for pianists to do that. Um, but but we did that already. So going forward, um, the last movement is uh, it's a rondo. It's fairly standard rondo. It's quite lighthearted and and quite cheerful in nature, just like the whole sonata. I think you know the whole thing is is um, is, is just fun. Uh, and there's a section in the, uh, right towards the beginning, uh, it, that's kind of a technical section um, uh, it, it, that, that gets you from one key to the, to the key he wants to be in. And then it comes back at the end, and it's the same thing, only in a different, so we're going from a different key to a different key. Only that one starts out um, higher in, the, in a higher register on the piano. And so it's a little high for him. And so when it comes back, he uh, reworks the, reworks the uh, figuration so that it keeps moving down octave by octave until he's way down here, <laughs> way down in the bass. And then, um, you know, he needs to, to crawl back up. I, I, I just think it's, it's uh, fun piano writing, which I, I will demonstrate. So this, this is for us to begin. <laughs> what gives him the idea and but what he does instead of just you know making a small adjustment he makes a big adjustment and so the figuration keeps going down uh, octave by octave until you get two octaves low and you're way down here in the growly bass and then he has to climb back up <laughs> Just thought that might be fun just to point that out. And 
And then I've already mentioned how the, the end uh, of the coda um, of the third movement and the first movement echo one another, and which, which is, I think, uh, you know, the end of the first, first movement is quite unusual, and then he, he comes back and he echoes it again, so, you know, yeah, don't forget it. So that concludes my little talk. If you like the little talk, you can leave a, 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 a message in the comment section. I liked the little talk. If you didn't, you say, well, I could do without the little talk. And of course, if you would like to do without the little talk, I, I did put a mile marker in the um, notes of the uh, thing, so you could just jump ahead. And if, if you have no opinion, you can either say I have no opinion or not leave a comment. So that's it. So now we'll go to the actual performance. And again, this is... Thank you.